uh, ELISA guidance on location data privacy. Uh, so first, uh, for those who don't know about ELISA, ELISA stands for European Location Interoperability Solution for e-government, and it's an action in the, of the part of the ISA Square program. Uh, it's providing a cross-border and cross-sector interoperability solution for public administration, businesses, and citizens. Uh, in the ISA Square action, there are 54 different actions actually tackling interoperability from different angles, whereas ELISA is the only one among them focusing on the location dimension uh, of, uh, as a driver for enabling the digital uh, government transformation. Uh, within this uh, context, uh, uh, ELISA knowledge transfer activities, uh, as you can see on the next slide, are uh, organizing periodically webinars, uh, 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 different kind of webinars, whose aims, uh, whose aim are to engage in an agile way uh, with the topics which are relevant for digital transformation. Uh, by harnessing the use of location data and technology, sharing, showcasing, and promoting the consolidated result of ELISA action activities. So the latter will be actually the, the focus and the aim of the today's webinar, uh, in which uh, our speakers uh, will guide us through the topic of uh, location data privacy. So actually showing how um, recent initiatives dealing with the personal data protection um, uh, resulting to um, uh, GDPR uh, legislative uh, uh, framework uh, are seen through the eyes of the loca location data, uh, supported as well by the different uh, ELISA activities. So today we have with us Massimo Pedroli, uh, senior consultant, and Gabriele Di Nillo, uh, senior expert in location data privacy, and uh, Ilenia uh, Piavice Conti, also senior expert in location data privacy, all three uh, coming uh, from uh, Deloitte. So uh, they will cover today um, the following topics, as you can see on the next slide. So uh, at the beginning, uh, try to explain, so what is personal data, look at personal location data and how does it relates to the location data privacy. Uh, following by the, let's say, why location data is important for, for me as a user. So that will be presented through different user journeys as uh, trying to, to explain uh, through different personas in different situations why this is important. Uh, that will be following, followed by uh, ELISA guidance on the location data privacy. So as mentioned, the, the activities in, through which ELISA has contributed to this topic and uh, ended by the conclusions and main takeaways. So this is the first part. In the second part, which will also uh, be uh, following after the, uh, the presentation part, there will be questions and answers. For these, actually we invited different experts that will share with us their views and experience, uh, as well as challenges and potential uh, uh, future developments needed in this domain domain. So I wish you very exciting 75 minutes of this webinar and I'm uh, asking now uh, Massimo Pedroli uh, to take the floor. Please Massimo. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, thank you, you all for uh, joining us today. Uh, basically, I will uh, pass immediately uh, the floor to my colleagues who will start introducing the topic uh relating to uh, personal location data and how it uh, applies and relates to location data privacy elena and gabriele yes okay i'm gabriele dinillo Thank you very much. Uh, the first section of this webinar is focused on the following question. What is personal location data and what is the relationship between personal location data and location data privacy? As you know, the, the general data protection regulation, GDPR, has been in effect in the entire European Union since May 25, 2018. The GDPR impacts many areas of an organization and public administration, such as legal and compliance, technology, and data. In particular, the GDPR introduced new requirements and challenges for legal and compliance functions. 
many organizations we require a data protection officer who will have a key role in assuring compliance. For the technology dimension, new requirements will mean changes to the ways in which technologies are designed and managed. In terms of data, having a better grasp of what data is collected and where it's stored will make it easy to comply with new data subject rights. Finally, the GDPR introduced a new maximum monetary penalty of 4% of annual global turnover that can be imposed in case of serious non-compliance. Taking into account this principle, these requirements, and the concerns that were raised with the introduction of the GDPR, we will find answers to this common question around personal location data and location data privacy. Which information is to be considered personal location data? How can I make sure the personal location data I'm collecting is compliant with the regulation? In other words, how can I demonstrate I'm complying with the regulations? I need to update or create policies that set out how my organization process personal data. Moreover, how can I give confidence to users of my app to trust the way I handle their location data? In other words, should I consider other compliance measures such as minimize the processing of the personal data, give individuals greater control of and visibility and apply suitable security measure. And finally, how can I minimize the risk to incurring some violation of privacy law when treating location data? I give you an interesting information. An immediate change of the introduction of the GDPR is greater public awareness of data protection, evidenced by a surge in individuals seeking to exercise their rights under the GDPR and increasing activities by privacy groups. So based on this consideration, the main element to allow you to address this, uh, the answer to this question is principle related to the context in which the question is asked. Please, next slide. The GDPR is the first piece of EU data protection regulation to mention location data explicitly, but with no clear cut legal definition. In this instance, we use the definitions of personal data and location data defined in the European Union legal framework. So what is personal data? We use the definition provided by the GDPR Article 4 Personal data means any information relating to an identify or identifiable natural person, the data subjects. An identified natural person is who can be identified directly and di or indirectly, in particular by reference to a, an identifier such as name, number, location data, online identifier, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what is location data? The definition includes any data within an, an implicit er, or explicit geog geography or geospatial reference, ranging from address data to radio signal based triangulation or IP address location. So a broad view of location data has been taken to encompass any many scenarios as possible. At the intersection, what is the personal location data? The personal location data is any location data directly or indirectly linked to a living individual or that can be directly or indirectly used to identify a living individual. It's necessary to underline that the GDPR only applies to living people or data subjects. It does not apply to the dead or the organization. In other words, organizations do not and cannot have personal information rights under GDPR. However, the personal information of the employee of an organization, for example, is protected by GDPR. The figure shows the three areas of consideration. On the left, the personal data, on the right, the location data, and the intersection. In taking this broad approach, it's important to draw a distinction between data that has location information and data that could have personal location information when combined with other data. It may be that in the combining of data set, the location data becomes personal information. Please, next slide. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ilenia. 
Gabriele told us um, about the importance of personal data and location data, but um, how privacy protection takes into account personal location data. According to the guidelines for public administration on location privacy, published by European Union in 2020, location data privacy is the individual try not to be subjected to unauthorized collection, aggregation, processing and distribution, including selling of its location data. It is the right to be protected by the ability to conceal information or whereabouts, which can be derived from personal location data. Next slide, please. In the following table, we have some examples of personal location data, but first of all, we need to answer to this question. Does the location data allow identifying an individual if yes, we are talking about personal location data. Let's take some example. If we collect telephone subscription account information linked to the smartphone and we combine this type of personal data with GPS coordinates of the location of a smartphone, so we have personal location data. At the same time, if we collect internet subscription account information with public IP address, or realty owner information with cadastral information with a realty, or license plate owner information with traffic footage on specific location, we have personal location data. So if we combine these two types of data sources, personal data and location data, the location of the individual can be identified. If we go back to the previous question, does the location data allow identifying an individual? And if we answer yes, it is very important to determine why, so the purpose and what, how the means data is processed. If you can do this, you are the data controller and you must confirm legitimacy, clear definition, legal compliance of data processing. If you can't determine why and how data is processed, you are the data processor and you must ensure safe treatment of data, notify possible breach and assist controller in ensuring compliance. In this particular historical context, there are new multiple privacy risks especially when processing personal location data. Governance activities specific to personal location data could be defined. Some examples of specific governance activities are guidelines on how to perform self-check if location data can potentially identify an individual or adopt a minimum set of um, security and privacy control specific to location data that should be applied when processing location data. data. For example, how to apply anonymization or pseudonymization technique. And risk assessment process and supporting risk assessment tool focusing on traits specific to location data. Public administration should assess the risks they expose data subject to when processing their location data, and this is not a one-off activity. As risk evolves, the likelihood and impact of these risks should be reassessed regularly. Next to the risk data subjects are exposed to, public administration expose themselves to risk as well when processing personal location data and the risk of, for example, non-compliance or data leakage, insufficient or ineffective security control should be assessed as well. This risk assessment should usually take the form of data protection impact assessment, so a DPIA or a privacy impact assessment, DIA. Thank you, next slide. I will take over from here. Um, thank you, Gabriele, thank you, Lenia. Um, we have chosen to uh, present uh, the subject of um, personal location data from the point of view of uh, concerned uh, stakeholders that uh, uh, can understand how privacy, location data privacy uh, is relevant for each of them. Uh, in order to do this, we have adopted uh, a user journey approach 
um, to show how um, specific stakeholders um, are understanding how location data privacy is relevant for them and how it impacts their own lives and activities, which are the challenges and risks to deal with uh, uh, personal location data and which are the privacy principles that should underline the use and treatment of personal location data. Finally, we will uh, show which is uh, the guidance provided by the LISE action related to that subject. We have considered uh, user journeys under the perspective of citizens, public administrations and business. In particular, we have considered three uh, user journeys for four personas. Um, in the first journey, we will see how a national statistician uh, is confronted with the use of personal location data. In the second journey, we will see how a public local administration officer uh, is dealing with the personal location data, potentially uh, facing challenges in doing so. In the third journey, we will consider jointly um, uh, the perspective of a citizen, uh, a passenger in this case, uh, a user of public transports, and a bus service provider, uh, both using and sharing personal location data in the same context. Let's now start with the first user journey. Let's see the point of view of a national statistician. Uh, Hannah, uh, a national statistician, uh, works in a national statistical office, um, in, in particular in a unit that has been collecting large amount of sensible data for several years. Among those data, there are also personal location data under the definition that was provided before. Uh, HANA's unit is now required to provide some personal data, including personal location data, such as addresses, um, that are needed for a policy assessment. So they shall be used by a third organization, um, uh, policy unit in this case to understand what the impacts of a certain future policy may be. Her unit, uh, Hannah's unit, also decides uh, to subject all collected personal location data to a business intelligence processing with the support of some external experts. Um, Hanna is in charge of identifying potential risks of this process in terms of data protection. She's aware of her responsibility protecting citizens' data and she's looking for guidance. In particular, she's worried about the possible violation of data protection rights of citizens in case the um, uh, public administration and the director of the other branch of the public administration uh, uses data out of their original scope. The possible unlawful use of the data by external consultants and suppliers and the risk of re-identifying individuals even if the data is anonymized. Um, obviously um, this may happen typically when a data set is uh, very granular. For, ex for instance, the inclusion of geographic details in a data set makes it much easier to re-identify users who live in small geographic areas. So the more granular the data set analyzed is, the highest the risk of uh, uh, re-identifying individuals, even in case of, re of anonymization is. Which are the privacy principles that should be applied here? Well, we have started mentioning some. First one is 
to apply data minimization. Um, in particular, HANA shall have to reflect whether a full data set is necessary to achieve the desired outcome or some of whether some personal data can be omitted. Another principle to follow is to secure data processing activities by applying security techniques to protect personal location data uh, to unlawful disclosure, from unlawful disclosure. ELISE, uh, in some of uh, its guidance documents that uh, we will uh, briefly go to later on, has provided some solutions. Um, HANA, first of all, um, may have to investigate what the purpose of data usage uh, by the director of the unit she will be supplying those data is. Um, what is the scope of using the data that she will be providing? Does the scope comply with the scope for which they were originally collected? This is the first check that she will have to do. Second um, activity to uh, perform here is to verify whether uh, and to which extent other parties um, for example, the external consultants um, will need the full data set or if only a limited data set uh, out of the available data could be sufficient for the external consultant to perform its uh, um, com contracted activities, uh, business intelligence in this case. Furthermore, she may need to ensure that the correct technical controls and contractual agreements for external staff on non-disclosure and acceptable use are put in place. Um, she would also have to decide if it's appropriate to apply further data anonymization on the personal location data. Finally, uh, as we said, uh, she may consider whether keeping out of the treated data set part of the information and value uh, intended, originally intended for that data set may impair the purpose of the research or whether by removing part of that information would allow uh, removing part of the risks of dealing with personal location data without necessarily impairing the quality of the, the research. For example, by reducing the precision and the granularity of geographical areas included in the analysis by aggregating uh, the smaller ones into larger ones. Let's now go to another um, stakeholder. We are now considering here a public administration officer, uh, Margot, a local public administration officer. Um, she is working uh, uh, in an office uh, which plans to promote a new service um, sending out personalized information brochures to um, citizens and potential users of this uh, future uh, service. Um, Margot wants to ensure that the data collection will respect all applicable laws and regulations on data location privacy, starting at the EU level, and she's concerned about this promotion plan. Um, promoting uh, activities can be problematic under GDPR as it may involve the use or reuse of data collected for one purpose to be used for another purpose. Uh, the privacy principles 
that she would have to comply with in this case is to achieve lawful processing of personal location data asking for a citizen's explicit consent before using his or her address data for purposes that are different from the original intended ones. Another key principle to comply with is to uh, um, allow um, data subjects' rights, including their rights to withdraw the consent to use data, personal data, uh, for any intended in even originally allowed purpose. In this case as well, Elise has provided some practical guidance. Um, following the uh, guidelines provided by Elise, Hannah understands that uh, it should be made clear to the citizen what is happening with his or her own data personal location data in this case, and why this is happening, including the specific purpose for which the personal data will be used, rather than just uh, uh, relying on general legislation. Um, under GDPR, uh, possibly this uh, uh, may be um, risky because personal gate data held and gathered for one purpose cannot be reused for another purpose. Um, a, pers a key aspect here is to take into account that uh, address data is probably the most frequently requested and stored personal location data by public administrations. Um, this principle implies that citizens should not be asked um, for the same data more than once with the objective to reduce the administrative burden for the citizens. Furthermore, the um, uh, public administration officer, Margot, in this case, um, should also uh, make sure that a personal location data protection program is implemented uh, as part of the guidance provided by her office to treat with this case. Let's now take another example. We are now moving to a user journey where uh, um, we involve two different profiles, two different personas. The first is the CEO of a bus service provider who's acting as data controller in this case. Um, Martin in particular is the CEO of a bus service provider offering an app uh, which has been developed and managed by a third party to plan trips and get updates on bus status using GPS. Uh, he plans to add new functionalities, in particular the integration with social, me social media to uh, save personal information and uh, favorite trips across all users' connected devices. Um, we must uh, for, point out here that uh, uh, there are specific critical challenges highlighted um, by surveys and uh, researches on the level of concerns uh, that uh, users and individuals uh, have about the use of their location data and uh, uh, their privacy. Um, even in cases where these may bring further additional benefits to them. Um, it has been shown from uh, recent surveys, uh, for example, that 84% of uh, uh, contacted and uh, uh, 
interviewed users are not willing um, at all to share their physical location data and 86% of those users are not willing to share their address data. So this intended uh, purpose may conflict with a general uh, trend by users and the reluctancy to share their own uh, personal location data. This uh, may actually conflict with uh, uh, the limited trust that users may have in uh, um, public services using their personal location data. Um, furthermore, we have to take into account that uh, uh, the limited um, impact that the action to uh, add this new functionality may have uh, on the uh, application may lead to inadequate data and service quality if the return provided by users to these uh, new functionality is limited. Looking at uh, this perspective uh, from the point of view of uh, a passenger, uh, from a citizen uh, point of view, we see that Tom works downtown and needs to take a bus every day for 40 minutes to reach um, his workplace. He's considering downloading a mobile app to receive real-time updates on the status of buses and fastest, it, fastest itineraries. Uh, he wonders whether to connect his app's account with the social media, but he is concerned, as we were mentioning, about sharing his location and other personal data. The risks and challenges that he faces um, are related to the inappropriate use of his own personal location data and uh, to the risk of using such data for uh, out of scope purposes and uh, the risk that such data be transferred to third parties. How can these possibly diverging interests can be um, dealt with? Uh, the pri privacy principles to follow are basically to ensure the lawful processing of personal location data, to apply data protection by design and default, starting from the design of the application and making sure that uh, all data set treated are inherently um, limited to the strict need of the intended purpose by applying data minimization, therefore, uh, and uh, applying uh, all intended measures to build trust, reminding that data subjects are also data owners in particular. Elise has uh, provided, in this case as well, some guidance um, it is necessary, first of all, for permission for data collection and uh, making sure that the purpose of the data to be collected is made clear to the uh, user. Making it as simple as possible, for example, by using uh, standardized icons or a simple representation uh, of uh, how the intended data processing would go. Um, a privacy notice uh, should be published in order to uh, make it clear also in a, a consistent uh, written form what the intended purpose of data collection would be. Uh, applying data protection by design and default, as we were, we were mentioning before, and data minimization, uh, for example, limiting uh, the 
data collection of data from the user only to what is strictly necessary to perform a good service and deliver a good service a typical example could be uh, instead of asking specifically what the user's age is ask for an age category uh, time brackets or possibly asking for uh, in case of location data a uh, range of uh, uh, areas where they could be located and intended uh, destinations furthermore it should be allowed uh, to um, users to uh, withdraw uh, and allow his or her consent to be forgotten Let us now see briefly what uh, uh, are the documents through which ELISA has provided guidance on the subject of location data privacy. Uh, ELISA has uh, uh, a major focus on ensuring location interoperability and the alignment with the ISA Square European Interoperability Framework, the EIF. Um, the uh, studies that uh, Elise has conducted have dealt with all of the levels of interoperability uh, covered by EIF and has translated them into a location perspective. This is shown, for example, here. The uh, um, European Interoperability Framework um, provides a series of recommendations related to the underlying principles, the interoperability layers, and the conceptual model for integrated public services that are referred to into a location specific framework, which is the ULF blueprint. ULF stands for European Union Location Framework, which provides guidance under different focus areas to actually implement location interoperability. The ULF recommendation reflect and correspond to EIF recommendations, implementing them into a concrete uh, geospatial and location domain. The uh, um, actual state of interoperability under the EIF is monitored by NIFO, which is a location um, interoperability, gener general interoperability observatory. Uh, providing a status of the um, in generic uh, general interoperability in member states by monitoring uh, how are the EIF recommendations implemented in the various countries. This is reflected in uh, the uh, LIFO, which is the Location Interoperability Framework Observatory, which focuses specifically on location interoperability and translates the ULF into indicators that monitor how the uh, location interoperability is uh, implemented in the various member states. Uh, LIFO provides, by the way, indicators to NIFO related specifically to the geospatial domain. In terms of detailed guidance, the um, uh, ULF blueprint and uh, the European interoperability framework uh, do have related recommendations, as you can see here. Uh, in particular, recommendation three of the ULF focuses on uh, location interoperability and uh, uh, data privacy, which corresponds to um, 
uh, EIF principles, interoperability layers, and uh, parts of the conceptual model. Uh, Elisa has dealt with uh, uh, location data privacy under different domains. Um, Elisa has worked uh, by providing studies, different studies, uh, uh, as you can see here, related to this uh, aspect. Frameworks and solutions, such as the ULF blueprint and uh, um, other um, material related to knowledge transfer, such as the Location Interoperability Framework Observatory. Uh, specifically working on uh, uh, webinars and uh, workshops. I'll briefly go through the uh, uh, ULF uh, blueprint and uh, location data privacy here, uh, pointing out, as we said, that the recommendation three is specifically focused on uh, uh, data privacy and provides concrete guidance on how to implement uh, such recommendation for the different stakeholders. Here, I would mention the main uh, artifact that uh, Elise has produced on uh, um, location privacy, the guidelines for uh, public administrations on location privacy. The goal of this document is to outline the key obligations that public administrations should comply with when handling with personal location data and raising awareness about the importance of location data privacy. It guides the reader through concrete scenarios that public administrations may face when processing personal location data. You will see there that the uh, the um, general structure of the document is very much uh, oriented around concrete cases that match the user journeys that we've seen before. Briefly, the location interoperability framework, the observatory for location interoperability in uh, the EU, shows that uh, there are still work to be done in terms of preparedness with GDPR concretely related uh, to location data. As you can see here, out of the 10 surveyed countries in 2019, only half of them declared to be fully prepared in all of these uh, uh, branches uh, against uh, location data privacy the rest of the countries still show uh, a way long way to go somehow towards location data privacy location data privacy and digital government transformation is another key uh, document uh, that uh, provides a, a conceptual framework for assessing the impacts of digital government transformation and shows how particularly key it is to build up citizens trust, as we mentioned before, to um, allow citizens to understand how their location data is treated and for which purpose, and to um, convey and transmit their personal data for the use of uh, data um, own treaters, uh, providers, and uh, public administrations. The, uh, another uh, interesting piece of work is the AI, AI watch, where it uh, is shown how artificial intelligence can be used to uh, analyze and uh, treat personal location data and how are the risks of uh, uh, using uh, such advanced analysis capacity uh, in uh, dealing with personal data. Uh, there's also a dedicated uh, page on JoinUp, the collaborative platform of uh, the European Commission under the ELISA con uh, collection to deal with uh, all that is related to privacy in the geospatial domain. 
let's now briefly talk about the impact that uh, uh, ELISA has had in uh, uh, the geospatial domain. Um, ELISA has contributed to the um, uh, methodological uh, framework for mapping requirements under data protection and privacy legislation under the uh, geospatial uh, information and privacy report of the WGC, the World Geospatial Industry Council. And uh, Elisa's work has been uh, cited in many scholarly publications and presentations. Here you can see a few of them. Finally and quickly, let's uh, now go through the key messages that uh, we wanted to convey here. Uh, common European data spaces and the interoperability coming with them become possible insofar users can trust, as we said, public administrations to respect data privacy and to keep companies and individuals generating the data uh, in control. Data privacy uh, is and will remain a major focus for all digital activities in the EU, also under the upcoming Digital Euro program that will replace the uh, ISA Square program, which does not only engage member states to request citizens and businesses only once the same information, uh, but also aims at allowing for interoperable, transparent, secure, privacy-aware and cross-border solutions deployed at a large scale to a large number of geographies covering different transport modes. Technological innovation in domains such as big data and artificial intelligence will also more and more change the framework in which data protection operates. This constitutes a, a significant challenge in order to assess compliance of such advances with data protection legislations, which uh, needs to be made an integral part of solution development practices. The concrete implementation of the, of the GDPR would significantly benefit from an approach where guidelines need to be explained in simple terms, as we said, and deployed in concrete use cases to increase users' awareness and the awareness of the operators working with personal location data. Finally, there are ethical issues to be taken into account in the use of technologies, enhancing the discoverability and elaboration of location information. Challenges can be summarized here under different perspectives. The peculiarities of uh, location data privacy that we can see here, uh, the characteristics that we mentioned of personal location data determining particular risks of the use of addresses, for example, as we mentioned. Um, furthermore, data stewardship can also be considered as a um, potential challenge because GDPR moves us towards a more open data definition of uh, data where it moves from data being owned by an organization to being under the stewardship of an organization. This means uh, to start changing the view and language around who owns the data. The detail level uh, scale on linkability of data is also a challenge because this uh, means to achieve the maximum level of detail that is useful uh, in producing data that is balanced against the protection of an individual's privacy. Um, public sectors also depend, as we have seen, on privately sourced technology, technologies, and this uh, uh, also means being potentially affected by trust issues related to them. Policy making and geospatial information also is key here because the, uh, there are clearly increasing difficulties for lawmakers to keep pace with technological developments and the awareness of public service providers is also key to uh, address the possible lack of awareness of collection, processing of personal location data and when uh, it is embedded within the overall process.
quickly challenge I've had a, a challenges here uh, the location data privacy um, in local and regional administrations is uh, ever increasing uh, as a concern because smart cities and regional public services are requesting increasing amounts of personal location information. The level of implementation of the GDPR places particular implementation burdens on new technologies, as we've seen, and this is also an increasing challenge. Location data privacy implications uh, for uh, businesses and commercial data ecosystems consist in increasing and possibly infringing use of location data for customer profiling. Uh, this, uh, for example, is related to the uh, use of promotional uh, informa uh, information for prom promotional purposes. Big data has to be carefully managed to avoid unauthorized data profiling for which location data constitutes critical information. Citizen generated and volunteer data in GDPR also are critical and uh, uh, it must be made sure that the purpose for which data provided by citizens uh, are used is lawful and explicitly authorized. Furthermore, the increase of uh, interoperability must be taken into account to take uh, the transfer of data between different member states uh, that uh, these may uh, comply, have to comply with possibly diverging national data protection laws. Uh, ELISE has provided uh, a body of knowledge that can be uptaken, uh, taken up by the Digital Euro program under different point of view uh, as presented here. There are different dimensions under which the future Digital Euro program can make use of uh, uh, the legacy of ELISE, providing uh, indications on how to build the future uh, axis of clean, sustainable and smart communities and mobility initiative in particular. We have now concluded here uh, and we have now a question and answer space uh, and also a panel. Simon? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Massimo, Gabriele, and uh, Elenia Pia, uh, for uh, driving us through different aspects of uh, location data privacy, presenting as well the main, let's say, concerns uh, and uh, in particular interesting user journeys as well uh, uh, highlighting also what Elisa has been done on this, um, on this field. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, we invited uh, as well several aspect, uh, experts today that uh, uh, would be able to uh, comment, let's say, after this presentation, maybe their views, uh, challenges and potential future developments on this domain uh, from different perspectives. So we would like to <clears throat> Uh, share with you uh, the, the perspective of the of, of the member states, uh, from the public administration, from business perspective, from citizen perspective, uh, as well as the local uh, uh, administration perspective. Uh, so maybe to start uh, somewhere to, to to break the ice, um, uh, I would suggest maybe to look at the at the member states. So how let's say location data issue uh, per, per privacy uh, issues and uh, topic is seen from, from that perspective, uh, how member states are, are ready? Uh, are there gaps somewhere with some, something missing, expecting more? Uh, how in the end uh, member states are uh, successful on bringing down this, uh, let's say, topic to the uh, regional and local governance structure, for example, in the use of smart cities and places. So I think uh, we have with us uh, here, uh, Charlotte. Charlotte, are you here with us? Charlotte Weber? Yes, yes, I am. And uh, yes, um, well, from a member state perspective and a public sector uh, perspective, uh, it would be nice to present myself, of course, and say, well, what is, what is my contribution to this? And um, as a data protection officer, uh, I am dealing on a daily basis uh, with a lot of questions uh, from a, pr a practical uh, perspective. And um, we have been in touch with uh, other uh, Nordic countries, other Nordic member states, in order to 
find out if we are aligned in our interpretation of the GDPR. And what we uh, did find out was that, yes, in some uh, specific uh, articles, we find uh, a common ground, but, but in others, it's very different because we are dealing with different kind of issues. We are having uh, different kinds of um, uh, products and services. So you have to go from actually uh, the real world in order to actually uh, get something out of the GDPR. You cannot just start with all the artists you look at them through and then make a conclusion on what you have to do. You actually have to turn it upside down and, and be very much hands-on in your approach. That's what we have experienced. Um, and especially in order to you know, find common grounds, we have to actually explain ourselves what kind of services uh, are we uh, doing as an address and uh, mapping authority here in Denmark uh, compared to uh, uh, a similar one in, 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 in Norway, for instance. Okay, thank you. So mentioning mentioning the real world, I think yes, this is uh, uh, very much very much important, and therefore uh, we've invited you as well, so to sharing the experiences from the real world. Maybe maybe the next step we should turn maybe to, to the business perspective a bit. Uh, uh, so we had uh, we had on the um, on the lease action on the on the on the. Um, uh, work that has been presented already uh, some experts that were dealing also from the from the lot of experience with the business uh, perspective so uh, implementation of gdpr and uh, location data privacy how is this seen from the business perspective is it enabler or blocker of the business perspective how, how where are where the let's say uh, aspects of the competitiveness perspective so how does it influence Maybe uh, Dara, if you could comment on on that a bit. Okay, can you can you hear and see me? Is that okay? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Um, so first of all, very interesting and very good presentation. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. Well, in business, I suppose just from a purely a business perspective, a, a private business perspective, a private business would just see GDPR as a cost, um, and and not necessarily contributing greatly to their bottom line, particularly in, in current circumstances. Now, um, it it does have advantages in terms of if you're trading across Europe and intertrade within European countries, because it, it does purport to have a, you know, a much singular standard. Now, it's not quite 100% there, but it's certainly a much better than it was. Um, it does present the challenge. It does present certain challenges and and obstacles to doing things, and um, where you can, which ne not necessarily a bad thing, because it's forcing you to think through your data program and your data management much more clearly, much more carefully, and um, and it makes you really put the customer at heart of everything you do, because you have to think of the customer requirements that are going to flow from GDPR. So from that perspective, it's it's good, and um, it. It, it, it allows companies to, um, you know, maybe push, to, or certainly did the data side of companies push through things that they were been hanging around for ages that nobody's done anything about and forces everybody to understand where their data comes from, how it's to be used, and what permissions you have to use that, which was a bit of a, a tough ask, uh, you know, at the start. And uh, so there are good data practices that, that are embedded within GDPR that we should, everybody should be doing anyway and maybe just ignored and, you know, maybe everybody has their housekeeping in order or a little more in order than it was. But it does present challenges. Um, so, for example, one of the things that was presented within the presentation on the persona, which I, I thought was very interesting, was about asking somebody for the consent. But what's not clear is how long that consent lasts for. Okay, it's not saying that the consent lasts indefinitely. It's not a perpetual consent, and you may have to go ask even even if it's for the same task, you may have to go back and ask for consent, uh, further consent to continue to use. Um, now that's not specifically spelled out in GDPR, but it, it's it's certainly becoming a question that's arising around it. So GDPR still has it's still very new. Um, it's still, you know, everybody really is still in their learning learning phases around GDPR, but how re what it re means in the real world. And uh, Charlotte mentioned a very good word, and it was also mentioned in the, pre in the presentation there, which is context. So every context is different, and every context presents a new challenge. And 
Another, another question that we're seeing that keeps coming up now is, um, okay, your data is anonymized and that's great, um, but how useful is it? The granularity disappears, the usefulness goes down, generally speaking. And then the second question that comes up is, okay, I'm, uh, I'm a data controller. When it goes over to somebody else and they mix it with other things, I'm not a data controller. You know, I, I don't have to worry about that. But there's a, there's a concern that um, as, a, as a producer of data or supplier of data, have I got, is there an implicit, because it's both direct and indirect in definition, is there an implicit obligation in me to keep watch of the market and what data sets are coming out to make sure my data set can't be mixed with another data set to reveal personal information? So it's creating a lot of challenges, a lot of interesting questions, and, but it has, has had also positive impacts. So it's not all negatives, but it's still early days, and it's not... It's definitely not the kind of thing that it's, it's kind of introduced a layer of effort that businesses probably wouldn't be jumping up and down to receive or any organization, to, to, to be honest, Simon. But I just sort of stop there. Maybe that's enough, uh, long enough answer. Yes, sure. Perfect. Thank you very much for sharing this. Uh, to some of your points, we may coming back later on, particularly, uh, as you mentioned, uh, GDPR is new, so it uh, refers also to the maturity and so on. But there were some other aspects mentioned as well. We had a question here about the trust, uh, uh, yeah. trust consent and so on. So I think uh, we should take into account here that citizen's perspective. So a bit uh, a, 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 as well, uh, explaining the active and the passive approach in particular on the citizen generated data and uh, uh, trust and or distrust situation that is maybe related in particularly to the, to the recent uh, uh, COVID situation, which is uh, uh, maybe impacting uh, as well, uh, let's say trust or distrust of the citizens of, on the G G uh, citizen generated data. Maybe Anna, uh, could you reflect on that please? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear, hear me well? Yes, perfect. Fantastic. Hello. Thank you, Simon, and thank you all the speakers for this fantastic talk and discussion. I think, um, yeah, there are, there are a number of uh, aspects raised here, and one definitely is that of trust. And let's say this afternoon, I can uh, share quite a different perspective maybe from the others as I've been working more on the proactive side. So the um, conscious uh, provision of citizen generated data to authorities to push them for action, especially in, in uh, relation to environmental enforcement. So of course I have, let's say the, uh, also the, the pleasure of um, sharing experiences of very successful cooperation where the citizen really wanted the authority to use their data and process them and so on. But I'm also aware that it's not always like that. So I think one of the first aspects we may want to reflect upon is this paradigm, paradigm of the active, active versus passive provision of uh, citizen generated content. And of course, we posit that when it's a um, sort of intentional provision of data, the citizen already take, uh, has taken into account eventual risks and has also, let's say, um, agreed and consented on the use by the authority that is providing to. Yet, as the uh, presentation stressed, the, um, the citizen may not have agreed to third parties to access this data. So for example, if the citizen is providing some data to the um, local municipality, they don't want a business to access them. So of course, it's important also to understand this one-to-one -one trust relationship. Then I think uh, an important aspect is also to consider the balance on the provision and uh, let's say um, what is given back to the citizen that is providing data. Because I think often we feel that um, it's not a mutual exchange, but it's rather uh, one direction, either the citizen pushing the authorities, not listening to the citizen, or vice versa, a lot of information given to the citizen without a sort of uh, feedback asked back. And we had the, uh, let's say, the experience of collaborating with the uh, Water Authority in Northern Italy, and there, there was very much the authority caring about a sort of bi-directional flow of information, which also helped creating trust. 
So I think for the question of trust, I would say that before asking whether the citizen trusts the way the authority processes the, the data, it's important to ask whether the citizen trusts the authority in first place. Because in many countries, there's not really about the specific data collection, but it's a sort of diffused general distrust in the uh, authority. And maybe lastly, I think um, it's important to nuance the discussion as also the concept of privacy in multicultural society, society that we live in, um, is not so straightforward. So um, I think many local authorities should also consider that migrants community may have a different understanding of data justice, privacy, data fairness, and so on and also on the application of the public interest clause. So for example, in the pandemic, we are seeing that many public uh, health authorities are using citizen data without necessarily the consent um, there. And this is a public interest scenario, but of course, I think communicating this to the, to the users, to the, uh, to the citizen is also really important. So yeah. Um, I would say I leave it there in view of the time, but great discussion. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, you mentioned the local uh, uh, administration, so this is the one that um, uh, citizens has the most uh, interaction with. And it would be good to hear also the perspective from their point of view, so how they are trying to build a citizen uh, customized public services and how this is related with the location data privacy and how the, uh, they are using the pri privacy by design in developing their IT services. So maybe is still with us uh, Gianluca, Gabriel, Gianluca uh, from uh, Florence? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good afternoon to everybody. Pleasure to, be, to meet you all and uh, many thanks for having invited us. Well, um, I'm in Florence, uh, we are working uh, since uh, several months uh, on um, um, the collection and analysis of uh, big data related to people uh, presence. Uh, we started uh, before COVID phase uh, by analyzing uh, data from uh, telco operators uh, to understand uh, um, touristic flows and uh, some citywide uh, um, movements of uh, population and uh, some uh, common uh, usages of uh, spots of the city. And uh, then uh, with, um, with the COVID uh, lockdown, we were very much involved in collecting data uh, from the public Wi-Fi network, use it as a network of sensors uh, in order to derive uh, the presence of people in several spots of the city. We are also now um, evaluating the usage of uh, 1,000 uh, video cameras in the city with video analytics uh, for people counting and uh, uh, traffic counting. Um, uh, with respect to Wi-Fi, uh, we have uh, more than 2,000 uh, public hotspots in the city and um, we have uh, proceeded, as you were mentioning before, with the privacy by default approach and by design, because uh, we um, uh, we started uh, by uh, by scratch uh, by uh, anonymizing data, for example, by um, also deleting uh, uh, data set with less than uh, n uh, instances in order to be sure that uh, uh, it was not possible to de to um, deduce information of the single uh, citizen. And uh, we are also providing data on um, to the decision makers uh, with the uh, uh, anonymized uh, dashboards. These data have been quite used uh, during the lockdown because they help uh, the lock a lot our uh, deputy mayors and mayor in order to decide which parks or gardens uh, to be closed. And now they are being uh, used also because uh, with the recent uh, national decree, the central government uh, um, asked the municipalities to decide which uh, areas of the city need to be locked down during night, for example. So uh, for data-driven decision, this data set and this work uh, is being uh, much useful. Uh, we also, uh, of course, uh, from the beginning, uh, uh, adopted uh, uh, privacy informative uh, to citizens uh, um, in the public Wi-Fi splash page. And uh, mm, well, we, we are working also on, uh, on the metadata um, 
optimization. These data for the moment are only internal use or internal use, but uh, we are working a lot with, uh, with other uh, standard, standardization bodies. I see in this call we have Antonio Rotun and Gabriele Ciasullo, which uh, I am very pleased to meet. Uh, uh, from EGID, which I thank a lot for their huge work because in Italy now we have uh, a very important reference point of standardization of uh, metadata uh, starting from the Inspire Directive and with the national uh, uh, repository for geodata. And uh, we are looking a lot on that work also for the standardization of our metadata. And uh, hopefully, hopefully we will also discuss with them uh, regarding location uh, data uh, for uh, for this type of data set uh, once we will decide to expose some parts of this data on the open data platforms, for example. Thank you very much, Gianluca, uh, as well for sharing the, 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 the perspective from the uh, local uh, administration. Uh, I think uh, with this we covered a bit, uh, as initially said, the, the real world, but coming back maybe to some points, so before to conclude, um, uh, and uh, uh, to see a, a bit of, as well in the future. So we mentioned, uh, so I think Dara, you mentioned uh, the GDPR is at the beginning. So how the maturity of GDPR, so um, where we are, so at why at all uh, location data privacy? So why not only GDPR? And uh, also from the, from the global perspective, uh, how we can see it uh, towards, let's say, other parts of the world, where we are with GDPR, can we see it as a, as a, as a successful uh, uh, export product of Europe. So maybe Ray or Dara, could you comment on that? I mean, I'm happy to come in if that's okay, Simon, Dara? Please. Yeah, fine, off you go. <laughs> well done, Ray. <laughs> yes, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, Europe is, uh, is a world leader here in, uh, in GDPR. And uh, Europe has recognized uh, the uh, uh, increasing digitization and use of data and uh, what uh, is, is happening in terms of uh, uh, impact on individuals. Uh, the rest of the world uh, is in some ways following uh, what, uh, what we've been doing in, in Europe with GDPR. Europe has an interest in, in getting a level playing field amongst it, its member states, and, and that's one of the uh, important factors. And uh, I think that's certainly by multinational companies, that's seen as a, a benefit. It's also seen as a benefit by individuals in them having a greater control and greater recognition of uh, what's happening to them. It's interesting with the COVID situation to see uh, what's happening with the various apps where in Europe uh, uh, there are guidelines from the commission on the sorts of apps which are talking about uh, uh, vo voluntary use of data, anonymization of data, keeping data for limited timescales. And if you look at uh, different regimes in different parts of the world, they have different cultures and uh, allow different apps to to help solve uh, the same problems and uh, you know the issues here are very specific around uh, around location so i think the covid situation is uh, it, you know provides an important illustration here uh, but it is early days on gdpr and we will see with the digital europe program and the setting up of european data spaces uh, the open data directive uh, and uh, what it will encourage, uh, we will see uh, you know, more uses of data and more challenges in terms of, uh, in terms of personal data. It will be very interesting to see the Digital Services Act, what that says about uh, the, the platforms and uh, protections of uh, uh, or personal data protections in the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, as everyone uses more mobile apps and we see more use of AI and uh, Internet of Things and facial recognition, technology will uh, give us benefits in the future, but also continue to present challenges which will need to be managed. Uh, I think it's interesting times for us all working in, in this space. Uh, I would encourage everyone to look at the guidance that's been prepared. Uh, certainly there's more detail in uh, ELISE guidance than there is in the EIF, 
but I would also encourage uh, people to look at the uh, guidance that's now available through, from DG Justice and uh, what, what they show on this. Uh, certainly, Elise's guidance is fully aligned with GDPR and what uh, DG Justice are, are, are saying. We give a location flavor to the issues and we have some interesting depth on topics like anonymization. So uh, I would encourage everyone to, uh, uh, to consider this topic uh, fully. And uh, your presence here is welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for all this. I think if you, before we conclude, maybe to the, to the last question, uh, there is some comment also from the, from the, from the audience. Uh, I don't know, uh, there's a Gregor. Uh, uh, would you like to present this uh, live? Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm working in the geodata preservation domain for the last five years and I've come across an interesting uh, uh, problem which is that uh, when the data is transferred to the archives, uh, the, the laws of privacy change. We had an interesting uh, problem when the National Bank of Slovenia would not transfer the numbers of uh, accounts to the archive because the archival law just protects uh, persons, uh, I mean, people from finding out your health conditions and uh, uh, some uh, political uh, personal information, but not other ones. So in the digital age, uh, uh, the time for transferring the data to the archives used to be 30 to 40 years, but in the digital age, it, it, it's a necessity to do it faster. And for instance, in Denmark, they do it after five years of the record uh, creation. And this uh, change of the law, uh, which let's say eliminates some uh, uh, safeguards provided by the GP GDPR uh, provides uh, a rather greater possibility for the abuse of this personal data. So I think we need to take this into account, uh, especially because uh, even five-year-old personal data can be misused in a way. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Gregor, for, uh, for this uh, intervention as well. Has anybody else from the public maybe would like to add anything before we conclude? Some further comments? Um, this is Dara again, Simone. Oops, yes. can you hear me? Yes. I was just looking at some of the questions coming through the chat box there, and uh, one of them was, how do you build trust? And I think that's one of the positives that comes from GDPR actually, is that it's within it is enshrined the idea of building trust. And um, uh, the, and really the way you do that is explaining very carefully and very clearly in plain English or plain language, what, why you want my data, how you're going to use it and how you're going to protect it. And um, trust is built up over time and lost very quickly if you, if you, if you fail to do that. So, um, that, that, that's just one that came up there. And then, um, did, is there, did, have we closed the gates too late? And I think the answer to that is no, we haven't. I think there is, um, there is you, you're, you're, the, the, the digital world moves so fast um, that no matter when you start it, it's always going to be either too late or too early. It doesn't matter. And I think as long as we've started and it is protecting personal data, as, as, as one of the earlier speakers said, it, it will work. Um, the, that gate is being closed slowly rather than quickly. The, 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 the rules of closing are, are now available to us, but the actions to follow through on it are still taking a bit of time. And, um, you know, we, 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 we've seen in some of the presentation that the, the, the application of GDPR is, is varied across both countries and vertically as well. And that's really coming down to precedence and practice of how we used to do things or how we do things around here. And that's a cultural change and that just takes time. So I think it isn't too late. I think it will work over time. And I think it is a very good way of building trust. Okay, yes, of course. Trust is one of the yeah. most important things in, 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 in this uh, topic in, in, in general. Uh, so since uh, we are five minutes uh, over the time already, I think we can uh, leave it here. Uh, so I think uh, it was uh, that uh, today's webinar brought you, uh, so the topic of the location data privacy a bit closer. And uh, it clearly showed that uh, with this, uh, we were actually, as was mentioned in the beginning, we started some process that uh, most probably would need to uh, some continuation, in particular to raise awareness uh, in the uh, 
public business sector and among citizens about these uh, uh, topics and challenges and for sure to to continue uh, what has been started uh, in particular to uh, uh, bring bring down all these uh, uh, challenges, uh, the recommendations and uh, experiences also to the local and regional level. So I would like to thank all the presenters uh, and all the, uh, let's say, that contributed to the discussion and uh, let that be everything for today. And you are kindly invited to follow us in our further uh, activities, in particular uh, webinars that we are preparing and see you soon. Good. Bye-bye. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, everyone. Bye.